Good morning and welcome to this edition of Tourismus Namibia, our weekly broadcast that we bring to you each Saturday morning. Um, as you can see, for the first time in a long time, I'm not alone in the studio. Monique Adams, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Frank. Yeah. I'm so excited to be on the show. Yeah, well, this is going to be what we're aiming for in the, in the future, as I said before. Uh, the idea being that you don't only always have to listen to my old boring <laughs> self. Um, so, yes, as we always do, it, uh, there's nothing new to that uh, format. Uh, we'll still bring you topics and we'll bring you destinations and also something interesting and uh, to the point. So, let's first have a quick peek at the marketplace and then we start off with topics. Yeah, welcome back. And uh, like we said, the uh, topics up first, and uh, we're trying to mix it up a bit. Monique has uh, basically contributed to a number of these as well. Um, but I'll start off because one of the more interesting items, I'm sure, for all of you as, as overseas as listeners, especially, uh, would be Lufthansa. They've uh, just changed their flight plans. So for tra travelers from Vintuk, new departure times have been relevant uh, since July the 15th. So all flights from Vintuk to Seo Kotaku Airport to Frankfurt will be delayed by 12 hours and 15 minutes now. So that implies that the passengers can now catch a flight at 7 a.m., so it's in the morning, instead of 6.45 p.m., and that would be on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. So rebooking to the new dates will be made free of charge, obviously, and uh, flights from Frankfurt take place on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays without a change in time. It would uh, still remain to be 9.50 a.m. So those are the changes in, in uh, Lufthansa flight. I think it's quite important for all of you to take note. And uh, you've brought us something as well. Yes, um, we have the Commerce Environmental Education Program, in short, KEEP. Um, still so soldiers on with support from the Go Green Fund. During the last quarter of 2020, the KEEP hosted 633 students, 322 girls and 311 boys, and 50 teachers from 12 different schools and organizations in the region. The program brings students from across the region to participate in field excursions at Danfil Yoon Gang Reserve on the outskirts of Vintuk and mainly focuses on hosting groups of grade 3 and grade 4 learners, accommodating more than 2,500 kids annually pre-COVID year. Since the beginning of this year, the team so far hosted 1,064 students and 22 teachers. Um, the program is designed and implemented by the Giraffe Conservation Fund, GCF, with support from the Go Green Fund, which is co-founded by NetBank and the Namibia Nature Foundation, doing amazing things for the young ones. Yeah, I think um, I actually like that a lot because yeah. um, um, I, I still feel there's not enough being done. Yes. Um, and I know that we at NMH are looking at, uh, um, if we if we start reintroducing the Namibia Tourism Expo, mm -hmm. one of our new aims is to somehow get the schools more involved, oh. not, not, not only in terms of hashtag Namibia and, and those sort of mm -hmm. things, but also in terms of um, getting them involved as a school, uh, looking at uh, local conservation programs yes. in their area, and then somehow bringing that to the party in Vintuk and have them basically market their yeah. own little environment. So. Yeah, hopefully that will be as soon as COVID finally leaves us. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's high time. And then obviously we had my favorite theme, uh, fracking. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, it's a new development. So while the Namibian government has so far clearly covered it, uh, the, the backs of uh, Canadian Gas and Exploration Company Reconnaissance Energy Africa, in short, Recon Africa, with regard to all exploration in the Kavango regions, 
international developments and, and progressing towards the point where fracking should be even be banned has been going on quite strongly now. So uh, Ireland is being urged by a coalition of experts and environmental organizations to submit a proposal to the UN General Assembly to ban oil production by fracking altogether. So uh, it's, it's more than 700 global organizations and, and, and the individuals have asked uh, Ireland to introduce a UN resolution to ban fracking. Um, and that is really the, the big headline because personalities such as the American scientist Sandra Steingraber, uh, Michelle Fetting, she's the program director of the Breathe project, and then German environmentalist and activist as well as advisor Andy Georgiou, and several other environmental uh, people and, and personalities among them, lawyer Scott Edwards, um, are, are part of that list. And uh, other names that appear on that list are Jane Fonda, Mark Ruffalo, Bill McKibben. And, and so, so there are a couple of very high, uh, um, yeah, high profile organizations in, and people involved in this whole thing. And uh, the idea is really to stop exactly what we suspect is, is happening up in the, in the northeast of Namibia right now. So fracking, um, yeah, I know that they're denying that it will happen, but fracking will altogether, altogether uh, need to be uh, forbidden for the simple fact yeah. that it has such a huge Which, environmental yes. impact. Yes. So, yeah, and then you've got another one there. Yes, we keep it moving. We have Snowman. <laughs> Two Namibian students, Stefan Kalitz on your left and Jesko Hoffman on your right, climbed the mountains in the Mount Rochelle Nature Reserve east of Stellenbosch in the Cape Province in the hope of finding snow last Wednesday morning. This is obviously not something most Namibians experience, especially in Africa. I mean, with the cold creeping in mm. heavily, <laughs> these days, um, I'm, I'm also like, can't it just snow a bit so I can experience well, that? Well, we've had it before. <laughs> um, I remember in 95 uh, and even after that, there was another occasion. But in 95, I specifically experienced it myself as you go out of Vintuk to mm -hmm. Harmony Center. And uh, there was a bit of snow up there. It obviously quickly turns into mud yes. in our case because it's quickly <laughs> warm again during the day, but it was uh, quite a sight to see in those years. Yes, yeah. that was a lovely pit photo from um, the two Namibian yeah. students. And <laughs> this is obviously further down the Cape because uh, so far we haven't seen snow. What we have seen though in this past week is uh, uh, some rain down at the Orange River. Oh. And uh, for us that's obviously serious because uh, um, Dissimilar to, to Europe, we obviously don't put our animals in, into shelters, shelters at night. Yeah. So when it rains, many of these get a cold or flu or whatever. Actually, it's, yes. it's, um, uh, it's, it's quite bad for the animals, especially uh, sheep. And mm -hmm. you find them in the, in the south. Yeah, and then finally, we've got uh, a writer of a special kind. Um, so we in, in Namibia obviously are quite concerned about the developments and those unrests uh, down in South Africa. And uh, as could have been expected on the international media and especially on the electronic media, we see some of the worst kinds of, 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 of video clips and, and, and really showing uh, humans from their worst possible side. But then I uh, stumbled across this video clip which uh, seems to show a looter of a different kind. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a different one and I thought it might just cool us down yeah. a bit and uh, it would be nice, at least this one is going for food and not for fridges and TVs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that brings us to the end of our, uh, the, of topics. our topics today, uh, today at least and uh, so up next we've got destinations. Well, 
well, destinations. Our first destination on the list is we got from Swakop Moon from Irina Marie van der Weld, as she introduces us to the Cornerstone Guest House. The Cornerstone Guest House is a small, private, peaceful bed and breakfast fully complement with the World Health Organization's recommended guidelines on COVID-19. They're quite close to the seafront in the center of the town of Swakop Mund. The R Marine Museum and the Old Brewery are, are close by and they describe themselves as offering the charm and intimacy of a family-run B&B combined with the modern amenities of a luxury hotel. Apart from Cornerstone Guest House, this group also offers under Moller self-catering apartments as well as other self-catering units at Atlantic Sicht and Moringa Gardens. All of their self-catering apartments are fitted to the highest standards with modern appliances and luxury finishings. Each apartment has three double bedrooms, sleeping up to six comfortably. Yeah, it seems quite inviting, this thing. Mm -hmm, it does. And it's very close to the Lions Old Age Home, so it's just down the road. And uh, it's uh, close to the uh, soccer club as well, SFC. Wow, and it gives such a homey feel. Mm. Just want to uh, appeal to our communities that the, we still have vaccine available. So the staff, uh, the uh, communities are thus um, edged to go to their nearest uh, vaccination point so that we can um, provide them with uh, With rising COVID-19 cases and deaths in Namibia, as well as the arrival of hundreds of thousands of doses of COVID-19 vaccines, the race to get vaccinated is on. The management and staff at Cornerstone Guest House in Swakopmund understand that getting the majority of the country vaccinated is vital for saving the tourism industry. Hello, I am Peter Bassingthwaite. I own Cornerstone Guest House here in Swakopmund. Uh, we've been going since 2008 and still very happily getting on with it. Except what's happened in the last year is, of course, last 18 months is of course COVID. Coronavirus has hit us very hard. It's hit the hospitality industry extremely hard. Um, for the last 18 months or since March last year, business has not been the same. We, we used to be chock block full all the time. We are now completely empty most of the time. Fortunately, there was a little upsurge uh, over Christmas and uh, beginning of this year, but now we're back to bad business again. Fortunately, there's still some brave clients who do travel from Switzerland especially, but they come from all over the world. At the moment, we've got somebody from Japan and Bangladesh, believe it or not, um, rather unusual, but they stay with us at the moment, leaving again today. And yes, um, that's how COVID has changed, I think. It's the big change has been lack of income, so we've had to reduce staff to a point and we've had to cut back on costs as much as possible to try and survive. And unfortunately, there's a little bit of savings we've got to put in every month, but um, I'm getting old. I need that money for my old age. <laughs> um, Vaccinations, we are all vaccinated here at Cornerstone, um, which I'm very proud of and happy to be able to announce. Um, I was, of course, the first guy to get vaccinated because I believe in leading by example. And there was a little bit of resistance from some of the staff, but fortunately I was able to convince them to consider getting the vaccination and They've all had their first vaccination. We've all had our first vaccination and a couple of them already had their second vaccination. So we all need it completely, completely vaccinated. And yes, we hope for the best. We hope that um, the whole of Namibia will get vaccinated so that tourism can pick up and we can take off from where we left off. However, in the beginning, not all of Bassing's weight staff was as eager as himself to get vaccinated. Hi, my name is Ismalinda Gomez. I'm from Cornerstone Guest House. I'm doing housekeeping. I would like to tell you the experience that I got from vaccinating. 
first I did panic I was not by myself because I didn't want to go at first but then I fought and my, my nurse told me no it has advantages it keeps the immune system stronger then I thought okay let me go for it but when I go for that dose I was panicking sitting in the row then later I got vaccinated but I was just feeling like my head was kind of like I, I was having a headache but later on it was fine and I'm happy to take that vaccine, vaccine that I got and I got a, a vaccine from India official so I'm okay mm -hmm. and I'm happy with that Amidst the third and deadliest wave of COVID-19 that Namibia has yet experienced, it would appear that Namibia's only answer lies in a syringe. Get vaccinated. It helps. What a great video from Irina Marie van der Wald all the way in Sokop Moon. Yes, and I must say um, I'm very impressed in, in how she presented the, the arguments and yes. to bring in some additional voices um, because mm. I think this is the biggest problem that there's so much resistance against the vaccine simply because of people not being informed Formed, properly. Yeah. Uh, their, their wrong understandings. I, I, I wish people would read the news as much as they read WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe uh, this whole yeah. problem would be just half as big as, as we experienced it. Yeah, and then up next we've got Sun Fontaine. Uh, I can confess that I've previously tried to to bring it on on the show, and uh, finally we've we've been able to do so. Uh, Sun Fontaine, that red little dot. It just it's just to show you, but it's it's towards the right hand side, or if you want to call it northeastern side of Nordova. And what you see at the bottom there is the Orange River. So it's in the middle of nowhere in a very, very semi-desert, harsh area. Um, so um, Sun Fontaine, very interesting. On their internet page, they introduce themselves by saying, far from the crowd in a wild and isolated corner of southern Namibia, southern Namibia, sorry, you'll find Sun Fontaine Lodge and Nature Reserve, a magical destination. And that is really what it is. It is a magical destination for nature lovers and adventure seekers alike, home to many species of animals, glassy rivers and airy eco-conscious bungalows. That's how they describe it, and they are. It is a soul-stirring place um, uh, found among magical mountain scenery where you'll have everything you need in order to relax and reconnect with uh, nature. And uh, there are obviously no schedules, so you are free to rest by the pool or soak up the semi-desert uh, vista from the main lodge bar or head out for a game drive and uh, to discover the natural diversity and wildlife of that part of the Namibian savanna. So space, silence and solitude is what they really sell and is, it's what awaits you on what they call uh, 200,000 acres of semi-desert terrain. So you won't be missing out on any modern uh, comforts as there's an outdoor swimming pool as you could see just now and all the other related uh, comforts and uh, apart from the game drives and uh, child care can also be organized your, the staff can also help you to plan a wildlife photography expedition for the whole family now this was clearly done in the in the recent good rains but still um, abundant uh, wildlife and I know for a fact down in that area people don't always think so but there's lots of kudu there's lots of game to be seen and I mean this is just extraordinary um, it is. It's, it's, it's something that uh, Chloe Derb recent or photographed some time ago when she went down the Orange River so this is really what you see this is the Orange River um, no actually it's not it's the river that comes past him this is the Orange River beautiful yeah
Frank, you know, watching that video footage, I could picture myself. I checked a few spots where mm -hmm. I can, you know, take pictures and post on my Instagram. It's such a beautiful place. It is. And, and you know, the, the, the problem is always that people think, and it's not that I've got anything against it, but people always think Namibia is equal to Sossos Flay. There's yeah. so many Sossos Flay type uh, areas and it doesn't always have to be the same destination. That's what I like about yes, the definitely. show, isn't it? Where we try and mix it up a bit. Yeah. And, uh, for those who come again and again, and so that they don't always have to go to the same places. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's uh, our destinations for today. Up next, we've got to the point. Yeah, to the point, uh, we, we just spoke earlier about fracking and the, the possibility of one day having it totally banned and uh, who knows, but uh, I can't see that happening in, mm -hmm. in, in the next few months or in a year or two. Um, this normally takes a long time to, to get going. So in the meantime, uh, we've got our problems right in front of our doorstep. Um, Recon Africa, um, I know some love them and some hate them. Um, our biggest concern has always been the fact that um, much of this whole project was started without really following the law of Namibia in terms of having an environmental impact assessment mm -hmm. being done at, in advance. In other words, before you start with a project, there are quite a number of items that need to be ticked, you know, in terms of the law. So there need to be permits in place to drill for water. There needs to be a permit in place to occupy that land. Yes. Um, and it's not only a case of the headman saying, OK, now you settle there. There are also considerations such as uh, the fact that, uh, for example, the chairman of the local forestry mm -hmm. association has to approve it first. And those are not uh, um, people from government, but those yeah. are actually local people. people. And uh, there are considerations uh, such as uh, cultural and uh, traditional living. Um, mm -hmm. So the Sun people up there, as well as the Kavango people, um, should have had uh, the opportunity to properly talk and listen and, and argue about the case yes. and agree to it if possible. I don't know. Uh, it's not for me always to only decide. But then there's that other misconception. People always think it's a, it's a story or it's, it's something that's really up to the Kavango people, people only. only. It's yeah. not. If I live in Oranje Mund, I'm an interested party because yes. it's part of my country. So what we did in the Africa Good Morning show um, this week, um, mm -hmm. we brought in quite a number of people. It's always difficult to get uh, um, Recon Africa to finally be prepared to join us on, yeah. on, on that sort of uh, a platform, but uh, so we spoke to other people and just found out what they think about this. Now, during the past 10 days, much has been stayed, said about the fact that a stock exchange investor, Viceroy Research, has made it very clear that it regards the gas and oil exploration effort by the Canadian junior exploration company, Reconnaissance Energy Africa, or as we all know it in Namibia, Recon Africa, as an absolute dud. Viceroy Research has decided to short sell shares of Reconnaissance Energy Africa Limited, registered on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the acronym of RECO. It described Recon Africa as a junior oil miner specializing in stock promotion and insider enrichment. Recon's mining assets are not highly speculative. They are borderline imaginary. Despite a market capitalization of roughly Canadian dollar 2 billion, Recon has a near zero chance of finding any asset of value in their exploration site and an even lower chance to capitalize on any find. That is a serious assessment. So we decided to speak to Gabriel Bernard of Viceroy Research. Good morning, Gabriel. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? 
I'm fantastic. Well. Yeah, that was a mouthful, but you know, that's what happens when you have insightful yeah. research. Okay, so let's get straight into our first question. Gabriel, those who follow the markets will know Viceroy has been involved in substantial investigations when it comes to markets trading. Locally, the name Steinhoff comes to mind. Could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what Viceroy Research is all about? Sure. Um, so I'm a co-founder of Viceroy Research. We are an investigative research firm and our research essentially supports our bet against bad companies and bad operators. Um, our team specializes in the discovery of corporate fraud, uh, accounting discrepancies, and we conduct deep dives due diligence to gather you know, primary empirical data. Um, our teams reported on several frauds and government failures uh, worldwide, notably, uh, you know, Steinhoff and Wirecard. Um, and the information provided has led to several indictments internationally. Um, Recon Africa ticked all the boxes uh, of what we look for in corporate misconduct and bad operators. So the thesis is very broad because it pretty much everything that we think can go wrong has gone wrong here. Um, as a precursor to the question, um, we note that our team was drawn initially to Recon Africa because of its rampant um, stock promotion. So, you know, paying for uh, third parties to essentially pump the stock of its price, uh, the price of its stock. Uh, we've never seen any junior miner or explorer spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Canadian dollars uh, to pay for advertisements, um, blogger reports, YouTube videos uh, to promote the stock with materially correct data and with an apparent aim of swindling uh, retail shareholders. Um, this, is not the, this is not the behavior we associate with legitimate businesses and good management. Um, this is the type of behavior we associate with corporate fraud. And see, despite any post hoc assertions to the contrary, Recon Africa did commence um, and we think they are still ongoing with a fracking campaign in Namibia. And fracking is environmentally disastrous, um, you know, to be very clear, and this comes from Namibia's Petroleum Commissioner, uh, Maggie Shino, who we spoke to, that the Namibian government will not license RICO or any other company to carry out fracking or unconventional hydrocarbon Instead, RICO has um, been, or has retained the services uh, formerly of uh, Knowledge Kati, a Namibian businessman who on multiple occasions profited from the false perception that Namibia has commercial oil uh, and openly disclosed to uh, his associates his intentions to bribe government officials. Parity. Um, with regards to former management, um, RICO's chairman, uh, Jay Park, has been implicated in the bribery of officials at previous exploration ventures in uh, Chad, Tunisia, and Somalia. Um, these ventures promised huge strikes of oil but failed to deliver, leaving you know both investors holding the bag and potentially governments with the, the cleanup efforts. And from a governance perspective, this is really, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Mm. All right. And in our fourth question, we know that Recon Africa is involved in Botswana and even on other similar venture in Angola. What is the take of Viceroy in terms of environmental issues in an African context, especially at a time when climate change has brought about serious financial rethinking, even on international stock exchanges? I think this is a really easy question that's discussed a lot, but irresponsible oil and gas development has consequences that are irreversible and really far reaching. From an African perspective, we look at you know Nigeria who rejoiced when they struck oil in the 50s, um, but what followed and you know this is ongoing is an environmental social and geopolitical disaster um communities have been destabilized by environmental destruction and disputes over resources the oil is contaminated destroyed soil water air and you know a one billion dollar cleanup effort paid by nigerian taxpayers traders we decided to also get some insight into the actual exploration activities unfortunately the problem is that recon africa does not conduct public press conferences for which reason we only can rely to third parties and with that in mind let's please have a chat with mr ian Ackert. good morning Ian. well first of all uh, we had to resort back to what um, recon told us right initially before it became an outcry in namibia and worldwide and that was really that they are looking at unconventional resources. But coming down to the scientific and the geological aspects of it, we know from the South African scenario here in the Karoo where I live, um, that the shales are the target of what 
organic or potentially oil and gas bearing shales. And that is what Recon Africa have stated from the outset, and that's what they say the geological model is in uh, pursuing. So the shales are very, very tight. They are so-called impermeable, almost impermeable. So the only way to allow oil or gas to flow from the rocks into the into the boreholes um, is to frack them. Um, there is no years. So that is why I am firmly of opinion, and I have this opinion is shared by many fellow geologists, that Recon Africa at some stage will have to resort to fracking to be able to release the trapped oil and gas that's in the first of all they've uh, come out with a lot of fanfare and announced to the world uh, and certainly to the investors that the first borehole showed um, a working hydrocarbon um, system yes we would expect that we know from historically that the the, the karoo uh, rocks do host uh, oil and gas um, however, they've made no information available to us, no verifiable information at all, not that we who are opposing this uh, process, but also for investors to verify that what they're saying is actually true. So the chances of them having um, struck a gold, as one we could call it, or oil, uh, in their first two so-called wildcat holes um, is is, is like looking for a needle in a haystack, literally. It is virtually impossible to be able to say that they have a working oil and gas or hydro indicated. They have no, they don't have the full toolbox of scientific uh, information. And the basic information, you know, typically in an exploration process is, takes a number of stages um, where minimal cost is, uh, is spent. Uh, and as each stage goes along, <coughs> more costs are expended and more confidence is gained. So typically you will go and you'll do your top literature search, you will get your information, your basic information. Then on the basis of that, you will see whatever scientific information is available. You will extrapolate that, you will reevaluate that, you'll reinterpret that. And that's precisely what they did. They've got the so-called ST1 borehole that was drilled in 1964. It's located 350 odd kilometers to the west. And they also obtained this Aramag um, data from the Namibian government. And on the basis of those two sources, they've now extrapolated that and come up with this very fancy model saying that they have the Kavango Basin, which shows the world's best uh, terrestrial oil and gas um, uh, potential. And But they don't have all the other tools in the toolbox. And so typically you then go on and you do your seismic survey, which they haven't done as yet. So it implies that the drilling that they have done are so-called wildcat holes. They based it purely on the error mag data without any seismic information. And on top of that, they've actually ignored information that is available. <clears throat> there is a <clears throat> gravity survey uh, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that was conducted at the same time as the Aramag. And if you overlay your gravity on top of your seismic, uh, I beg your pardon, your Aramag, you'll see that the area in which they're currently working shows very limited. The fact that Recon Africa and their directors are hiding behind very slick marketing uh, releases, very slick uh, uh, public relations releases, but none of the directors have ever been uh, in any forum at all where they have actually defended their actions or um, <coughs> promoted this. So I would really, if, it, if I had my choice here and now, I would love to challenge the directors or a director of Recon Africa, preferably Mr. Scott Evans, the CEO. I would love to challenge him to a public debate set in a forum, perhaps <coughs> um, chaired by an independent uh, Namibian organization and conducted in Namibia so that we can actually see them in the public forum and, and, and have a transparent, open exchange of concepts and ideas so that the public out there can actually make up their own mind as to what is really going on in Kavan. Uh, first of all, let me let me tell you that I'm not an expert in, in this regard, but I mean, I'm just applying a little bit of common sense uh, here. Um, we, if you look at conventional oil drilling, uh, the impact should be rather local and, and should not have a or, or yeah, uh, cross-country effect um, or for the entire delta, um, so to say. Um, but um, the story is a little bit different when you look at fracking and from what, what I've read and what I've seen about fracking uh, from other parts in the world. And um, I mean, uh, the, the technology, I understand it, it's, it's um, 
huge amounts of chemicals are combined with a lot of water and that water is then pumped into into the soil or into deeper areas of, of the ground <clears throat> and with that then uh, the oil um, and, and the gases are released from the soil and then are taken out and then uh, used for, for, for to, to, to actually get oil from it um, which then can be used for petrol etc etc um, that is something which has a far greater impact on on uh, the deeper areas of, of the, the soil, but also then obviously the topsoils um, will be impacted. The, uh, also the water levels, uh, the groundwater actually is, is impacted, of course. And um, with with a lack of water, obviously without water, no life is possible. Um, and with the harsh conditions we know in Namibia, um, with the sun, strong sun radiation um, and the lack of water then uh, trees won't survive plants won't survive and therefore also the very basis of of all life for all animals etc um, will have a problem um, so in that regard i have a big question mark whether fracking is something uh, namibia should endeavor into um, but having said that um, and earlier um, it is i think also an opportunity if done carefully and properly and properly assessed also uh, it could be an opportunity for conventional oil drilling uh, at least to bridge the time until alternative uh, fuels of energy sources are available in abundance um, and namibia actually has a great opportunity here i think namibia is, is one of the uh, few countries in the world which has a huge potential um, not only for for solar power um, but also for wind power in some areas uh, tidal power is, is, is another issue um, or aspect which which nobody we should definitely should look into um, but it also is only, is only one step um, in in the whole process um, Namibia could become the next uh, Texas well uh, as, as said already you know um, I think the local is lacquer approach it really should should be um, the approach here to to apply um, renewable energies and I think that's really an opportunity for Namibia also to become an energy exporter over time um, using solar power, using hi um, hydrogen, um, using hydropower systems uh, systems. Also. If, if there is oil available in Namibia and it can be used in a conventional way where you somewhat can control the environmental impact I also think that it is an opportunity for Namibia um, to, to use that uh, uh, source um, to fund um, and um, some of the or to invest in that for the, in the beginning but then also use some of those money to invest in, in new renewable energy sources and, and technology of, of in, in that regard. I think uh, one has to look at, at, uh, at all these things holistically um, um, and, and we always talk about sustainability and uh, many people just uh, misplace uh, sustainability only from an environmental perspective for sustainability rests on three pillars the economic pillar the social pillar and the environmental pillar and they all three need to strike a balance so we need to when looking at, at a sustainable approach uh, we need to make sure that for instance the use of, of oil uh, helps um, the people um, and and uh, so therefore um, you know creates revenue it creates value it creates uh, but then at the same time it also needs to create jobs um, so the livelihoods of people uh, improve um, but at the same time we cannot do this at the expense of the environment we need to manage that and and so whatever we do and whatever in, we in, endeavor into in terms of, of uh, growth we always need to look at that well, wow. there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> powerful points over there yeah, and, and, and uh, really I think the important part is uh, that we need to, to start informing the public so that they can uh, make up their own mind. Um, yes. And uh, the good thing about it was up to now, Recon Africa has often shied away from, from uh, facing the media mm -hmm. for whatever reasons. Um, and uh, they've now contacted us and they would like to, to speak on the evening review. So wow. hopefully that will come off sometime because I think it's important um, to me. This is really a matter of people need to know where no. they stand. Yes. And I, I truly feel that the government is not contributing its, uh, its part in terms of being honest and, and, and just uh, 
stating it as it as is, it is yes. um, because people just want to to know. It's almost like COVID. You want you want uh, uh, sincerity. You want mm -hmm. to know what is going on, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Just tell us what's going on so that we don't speculate out yes. there. So a very important subject, and uh, we've brought it uh, up in this show very often. I hope you enjoyed the show because this is the end of it. Um, oh no! Yeah, thank you for <laughs> for taking part. And uh, Monique is, is one of hopefully many of my colleagues which, which will join me or who will join me in the, in the future. Yes. And uh, she's already committed to still joining us next week. So That's until right. that time. I'm excited. See you guys next time. And yeah, enjoy your weekend and stay safe. Yeah, very important. Remain safe.